<laughs> I remember when we were in our bedroom at the old house. Yeah. And <laughs> we were trying to shoot. What? Those videos. Which ones? The ones that you kept messing up. <laughs> It was the first time that we used GarageBand, and we were trying to do videos for the competition. Oh, and it took forever. <laughs> and you were like, <laughs> what was it called? Uh, King of the Mountain 3.1. And then you'd get like two cents in, and then you'd just, I'd be giggling in the back, and you're like, stop it. <laughs> yeah, that was hard. Yeah, this is, well, this look is at very how far similar. You've come. Yeah, not that far. <laughs> not that far at all. Uh, okay, here we go. All right. Hey, guys, welcome to The Coach's Podcast. Today's guest is a coach I never wanted to hire, but is one of my more influential coaches. It is someone who I'm married to, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, she's my best friend. So welcome Tara, a.k.a. Sugar, if you guys know that I call her that, I call her Sugar all the time. Welcome to the first episode. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so for those of you guys that haven't been watching, we've been, uh, at least the first introduction part at least took us 20 minutes or so. But it was uh, an evolution. I think our first time I introduced something was five, ten years ago, and we just recently talked about it. I think it took me an hour to shoot a 10-second intro. And uh, she said it's evolved, but I'm like, nope, this is still just as difficult as the last time. And today, I really want to just, I feel like it's going to be a little bit more uh, kind of an understanding of what this podcast is really going to be about. I am going to be interviewing my wife my wife has preset questions that she's going to interview me because I want you guys to get an understanding of kind of what this podcast is really going to be about because it's going to be two parts and I want to make sure it captures that on this first episode, especially if you're, if you're listening to this, I apologize, but it's your first one. So you get to know kind of what the episodes are going to be out, be about moving forward. So with that said, Let's go right into the first question. Okay. And my first question <clears throat> here is, what's it like to be married to a monster? And what I mean by monster, it's someone that's just an ambitious, um, ambitious <laughs> entrepreneur <laughs> that can't really talk. <laughs> and, okay. uh, and what I mean by that, I mean, you'll, you've seen me in stages where I'm extremely excited, and then you'll see me in stages where I'm a little dark storm cloud. So mm -hmm. I want to really go about talking about that, but you've, you've also guided me in a way where it's, I feel like you have a framework, maybe you don't have a framework, but you've really guided me in, in a lot of what I do now. What's that like? <laughs> well, I think it can be really difficult sometimes for sure to be mm -hmm. married to you, but it can also be the easiest thing in the world. So... Yeah. When we are in sync and we're doing things together, yes. I think that's when we thrive, when we have a common goal that we're working towards and somehow you weave me into it. Yeah. So when you let me in a little bit more to your crazy, what you're thinking, then that's usually when more of the magic happens. When you're a dark storm cloud and you don't let me in. Yeah. And I can just see that you're in your head and you won't share, then that's usually where there's disconnect. So mm -hmm. the things that I typically do is not take it personally, try yeah. and show you extra love, which can be hard to do, but that's, I feel like a lot of my mind work that I have to do around that to make sure that I'm not taking things personally and then see that you're in a dark place because of what's going on internally with you. Yeah. Not something that I've caused, even if it causes you to snap or be shorter, it's still you being in pain. So how can I reach out? And usually there's simple things, give you space, encourage you, oh. buy you a coffee, <laughs> Yep. make you food. That's it. 
coffee yeah. food. It's pretty simple. Yeah. And you, yeah, you like if I can do anything that supports you. Mm -hmm. So if I can be in some way of service to whatever you're working on, even if it's just listening when you finally kind of let me into a problem and just, yeah, we talk about business a lot. <laughs> yeah. At least I do. <laughs> right. Yeah. You do. I just do more of the listening, but mm -hmm. I think that helps you because when you, the darkest times that you've had are times when you feel like it's just you and no one understands you yes. and no one on your team understands you. And then you've even said that I don't understand you, which I don't think I a hundred percent do, yeah. but I would be the nearest person I believe that would understand what you're going through or could at least empathize and say, maybe I don't know what it feels like to have that many employees or be responsible for that amount of money or helping that many people, but at least I can empath empathize with that yeah. and say, yeah, that must suck today. Yeah. Like I, I find it interesting because you do empathize and you do really well at that. That's why I just lay it out on you, one. Mm -hmm. But two, you'll pepper in things that are just like concrete actions. You're like, yeah, you should do that. But then I don't do it for about <laughs> seven months. <laughs> and then I come back to you and I was like, oh my gosh, this mentor told me to do this and then I did it. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, but I told you that like seven months ago. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I can tell I'm hitting a wall, but maybe I'm planting a seed yeah. and that uh, you'll come back around to the idea. It so, is, yeah, yeah. But sometimes your initial reactions to something makes me know that you should be doing it. So even when we first talked about selling our old house, yes, you had such a huge overreaction to it that yeah. I was like, wow, you need to do some work around that. It is, yeah. What does that mean to you? Your identity must be wrapped up somehow mm -hmm. in the idea of you owning that home because that was your first house that you that bought was my first investment yeah which took a lot of effort and so I think me just casually saying like well maybe we could just sell the house and you were like what <laughs> like yeah. I could tell you attack. just went from zero to ten like yeah just panic mm -hmm. and so then sometimes I think well that's you you got to work through that on your own I might be able to give you a few pointers or say what yeah. makes sense logically but you usually have to be quiet and be on your own. Yes. So if you go somewhere in nature, if you go out and run or go to your favorite park, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll come back and then usually like, you'll right. say, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that I've learned being in a relationship with you for so long that every time I'm triggered, Mm-hmm and I'm super angry, there is a lesson in there. And in fact, there's a little bit of truth. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when you say things to me and it doesn't affect me, then it has little truth to it. Right. So in, in that one moment where you're like, well, this is the situation that we're in. These are the best possible solutions. Mm -hmm. I think we should sell the house, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, it, it, I'm so mad because it's so true. Mm -hmm. But then the other side to it is all of the drama I've like put into my worth, thinking that that was a huge piece. And we've done that for so many times. And I think when we start to interview coaches, sometimes the, the most influential, the most impactful coach is not necessarily a coach. You're not. Pay I'm not paying you to coach me, but mm -hmm. it's the one directly closest to you, the yeah. one that knows your wins, the ones that knows your demons, the ones that knows when you're bored. I think those coaches are going to be more impactful. And I just wanted to recognize that to the audience because as we start to really interview some of the greatest coaches in their field, I think they can forget the their top five the closest five that's the closest to them yeah. are also going to be their biggest coach and i think it's important to build that relationship over the course of your life so that's why i'm like yeah 
she is one of my most influential coaches, my most impactful coaches. It's the coach I've never hired, but she does control and she does influence the actions that I do in business, but also the actions that I do as a father. I don't think I'd be a, nearly as good as a father until, until you harassed me with certain things and also a husband because of, because of you. So I'm pumped to do this. Give me some questions. Thank I you. gave you some questions to look at because because I'm interviewing you on, in that. I want you to interview me so we can get kind of an idea of what this thing is all about. So tell me a little bit about the concept behind why you wanted to start this podcast. Podcast. So to be transparent, I think we had three or four different titles yeah. before it started. And one of my biggest fears was pigeonholing myself into just fitness, mm -hmm. right? So I've been in fitness for over a decade. And don't get me wrong, I'm passionate about it, right? But I, but I also seek the other sides of it. I want to not only know about health, I want to know about relationships. I want to mm -hmm. know about spirituality. I want to know about leadership. I'm obsessed with business. I'm obsessed with sales. So there's one piece where it's like, okay, I can't just make this about gym coaches. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm interviewing the best coaches. So part, part one is one of the things that, that my wife does really well is I, I call her kind of my gratitude police. In, in my darkest moments, and like you've seen me in my darkest moments, mm -hmm. you start out with just like, what are three things that you're grateful for? You know, and it starts out very small. It's like, I, I can, I can, I'm fit. I have a house. I have a son that's phenomenal. And then it starts to stem into other things, right? And one of those things, I think I complained about you. And I was like, I'm so frustrated about coaches. I'm so frustrated about that. Mm -hmm. And you were like, but you have X, Y, and Z coach. You have this. And then you asked me a question that really created another seed that was like, wait, why am I not coaching coaches? And I started to understand that I lacked gratitude in being the position that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I never recognized how amazing my life is already. And, and then and once I started to recognize that, it really started to change for me. So one, I was like, I don't, I don't really worry about my health. Right. I'm extremely healthy, I'm extremely fit, I can do anything that I want physically. So that was one of the easy things that I did. Mm -hmm. Another thing was, I get to surround myself with people that are not in the hole. In fact, they are like thriving individuals that have goals, aspirations, ambitions. So naturally, I attract just really amazing and happy people. Right? And then the second thing, I get to see people's lives change, not only individually, but I get to see their families change. They're like, hey, my wife wants to come with me. My daughter mm -hmm. wants to come with me. Hey, can they go to the hike? Right? We, I see this immediate impact. So connection-wise, I see that. Health-wise, I see that. But also financially, even though I'm so blind about it, financially, I did well for myself. Mm -hmm. I opened more, multiple gyms. I've lost one. But I'm able to <laughs> open multiple. Yeah. Right? I bought a house, I bought another house, we bought two condos, right? I'm able to fund a life that I thought was once impossible as a trainer and I've been living that. And one of the biggest lessons for me in, in that gratitude practice that you've seeded was, was I wasn't ready to coach me and get somebody else in that space of where I'm at now because I wasn't completely grateful. Right. And then because you, you're a gratitude police, you're just like, what are you <laughs> grateful for? I was like, nothing. <laughs> you get world. mad when I ask you that. Guys, and it's so powerful. It I is. do get mad because of how simple it is. Right. But then you still do it. Yeah, you still do it, but just so that people understand when you're not in a state of gratitude and then asking someone yeah. to come up with something that they're grateful for, it can just feel like you've done that to me as well plenty of attack. times. And you've even walked into the room before just 
your posture is telling me that you had a great energy. Yeah. You were wanting to share and you're positive and you're coming in and I'm like sitting on the couch hunched over and I'm just like, oh, look at your energy. Yeah. So sometimes when you're in that, it's very hard. And you will actually, something that you do mm-hmm. is you physically will change my posture. So if I'm huddled like this, if I'm crying, yeah. you will make me stand up. You will make me put my hands above my head. You'll usually like start dancing a little bit with me, get really yeah. close. And then it breaks that, you know, physical yeah. hurt that I'm feeling and it's a release. And so yeah. you're really good about that too. I'd say I use probably the gratitude, but you usually physically change where I'm at to change my state of mind. Mm-hmm. And that can be really powerful. And so we have different tricks that we use on each other that we yeah. know work, but yeah, it can be hard when you see someone else who's at a different energy state than you and you don't want to be pulled up. You want to stay you wanna low. Stay there, yeah. You want to stay in your little pity party. And so we've gone back and forth. I think we've talked about it many times too, because in the beginning of our relationship, I didn't know how to pull you out of where you were at. So when you weren't in that mode, Mm -hmm. I would ask you, well, what can I try next time? Yes. I think the gratitude worked better than for a while. We were just, (laughs) you're like, you're like, yo, don't be a beep. Yeah. And then that worked really well. And I think it backfired on one of them, Mm -hmm. one of the situations. And I think there's a lesson here, like a coach to a athlete type of relationship. Mm -hmm. You are like finding each other and it's okay to experiment. And you're like this Royce moves when I tell him this very interesting. But Mm -hmm. then when I say this, it doesn't work. And you've coached me through that. And, and there's like, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but then you have like your tool sets, mm-hmm. like 80%. I know gratitude's going to work. Ooh, I think I can pepper the don't be a B word on this one for <laughs> sure. When I have injuries. Yeah. Oh, yeah stop being a little B. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, I just jam my toes. And then you're like, don't be, I'm like, oh, all right, I'm going to go run. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's like those tools, but you've also used the tool. Uh, which I think is extremely, it's like you don't think it's coaching, but it is, is you're just like, I'm out of here. <laughs> like he's a dark cloud. There's no use. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab Lucas and I'm just going to go. When, when, when do you know, <laughs> when do you know you have to use that tool with me? Well, mostly that's me making sure I'm doing everything that I need to do. If I have energy to hold space and to be there to empathize with you, it takes energy from me. That's true. Yeah. And I try and make sure that I'm not giving you so much that I'm empty myself. So if I feel like if I get home, you're in a mood, something is happening that it was specifically when you were fasting for a few days where you just <laughs> really were uh, difficult to be that around was my first three-day fast yeah in my, my second five-day fast I was that went much smoother but yes yeah, your first three-day fast I just thought I actually don't need to be here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can actually yeah. create my day and I knew what your day was going to look like because you still had Mm-hmm. a day and a half left of not eating. It was painful. And so I thought, he actually doesn't need me here. It's okay. Yeah. I'm going to just take myself and take Lucas, and we're going to have a fun day in Mount Charleston, and we'll see you yeah. when we get back. And so I think that's important in a relationship, too, when to take distance and when not. Yeah. I think you used to tell people about in the beginning of our relationship when we had, you know, a little bit of an argument and then I went in the other room for the day yes. and you were thinking all day long, like that we were in a fight, that we oh, were yeah. mad at each other. And so you were like amping up just thinking about when we would 
you know, see each other again in the house. Mm -hmm. And I was just having a great day. <laughs> I just like <laughs> moved on from it. Yeah. And I don't even know what I was doing, watching movies, listening you were to music. Songs, I was singing and watching Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that day. And guys, for those of you that don't know that story, <laughs> I'm coming home from a 60 to 80 hour work week and I'm sometimes very tired, so I throw my clothes into the laundry. And sometimes I don't hit the actual laundry basket, but in that specific day, you like blew up on me. I thought you blew up on me. It was like, hey, mm -hmm. just put the laundry in that basket. <laughs> and then I'm like, um, excuse me, <laughs> right? But I said that in my head and I just, mm -hmm. and, and, and all day, so this was like in the morning, right? It was like, it was like a half day for me. Yeah. And I was like, excuse me. I was like, okay, cool. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take it out on her. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the way I thought of taking it out on her was just to completely ignore her. And that's what I did. So for the whole day, I kind of ignored no talking, but then <laughs> That strategy doesn't work, guys, <laughs> when your wife is having a blast the entire time. <laughs> so she's in her space, singing her songs, watching her, her TV show, and I'm just like red hot. <laughs> all day. Like all day. <laughs> so we get in to bed, and then I'm like, you know what? She's going to know more. I'm going to be even more quieter. <laughs> and then two, I'm going to like... I'm going to like inch myself to the, the edges of like the very edge. Mm -hmm. Literally, I was in the very edge, yeah. like one, one foot hanging off the floor. And, uh, and I'm like, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to sleep first and she's going to know I'm mad. She's going to know I'm super mad. So I'm trying to count my breaths. And then next thing I know, she starts snoring. She's just like, <gasps> and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So I'm red hot, obviously, and I'm just mm -hmm. so angry. And then what ended up happening was for me to cool down, I started, I started gratitude again. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is my best friend. She makes me food every day. In fact, she actually did my clothes that day, mm -hmm. right? And she's, uh, she's just always been supportive. So eventually, as I started to do that, I fell asleep. And then I woke up that day, and then I told you about it, and then you just kept on laughing you know? know. and then I was like rule <laughs> rule number one we can't go we can't go to bed angry right mm -hmm. and that's like a, a new uh, that's we've been doing that for yeah. for years now so sometimes I might be angry sometimes you might be angry sometimes we're both angry but we we, we tend to like that's just a, a staple mm -hmm. so if I know I'm triggered I'm not gonna wait till the next morning I'm gonna let them know now yeah. right and I think it's such a valuable lesson because you said going into whatever scenario, whatever whatever you're feeling, I know how much energy I have. And if I know it's gonna drain me, it's not gonna be worth it. I think a lot of practitioners and coaches don't know that. They right. just say yes to helping every single person, every single client, and then they find themselves depleted. And they're not yeah. only hurting themselves, they're also hurting their clients. And you've somehow figured that out in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of coaches understand those little things yeah. can affect everything. Well, I think it'll be fun for you to ask coaches how they're taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure that just like we've found, you have to change that over time, depending on where you're at in life. It was much different when we didn't have our son. Yeah. And everything kind of was amplified after that. And the things that maybe previously worked didn't anymore. Yes. And so it'll be fun, I think, to find out from coaches some new strategies that we could even test out. What are they doing to take care of themselves? Yes. Yeah. So one part for the audience that's listening in, one of them is really sharing the best coaching practices, not just as a gym coach. I will be covering a lot of the gym coach stuff because it's just what I've lived in, and I feel like I have to do it. I have to share all my knowledge in the gym space, in the coaching space, in the personal training space. But the other side to this is interviewing other coaches. Mm -hmm. But our philosophy is the best coaches always have coaches. And what I mean by that, anytime you coach, because by the way, guys, my wife is a dietitian, a registered dietitian, way different 
right? So, <laughs> so she, she coaches other people, but a lot of times, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I'm coaching someone, mm-hmm. I often learn more than the actual student. Yes. Right? And, and that's the whole concept of this. We want to inspire others to coach other people, not just because you're, you're helping them, mm-hmm. but you're making yourself better trying to help someone else be better. Yeah. Right? So as I'm interviewing these coaches, I'm not only learning from them, but they're also benefiting from teaching me. And then as I'm teaching someone else it's benefiting me and vice versa so if you're trying to become one of the best coaches it's important that you're not only getting coaching Mm -hmm. one you're always coaching somebody else the mentor and the mentee is like so critical in terms of being effective as a coach yeah and we learn a lot from our clients that we coach Mm -hmm. but that's much different than when you are learning from a mentor in your field so you're gonna learn both but i think some people are potentially nervous or not as confident to teach someone what they've learned in their coaching practice but honestly if you're even six months or a year ahead of someone else, Mm -hmm. you can still turn around and help them and show them a path that they could get much faster, the results that you just got yourself. And it's very rewarding. So that's always been part of what I've liked to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I started teaching very young, but then taking interns and having students is so important to me. I love it. Yeah. Okay, I wanna save this for the last question. Mm Because I feel like we covered a lot. And we're absolutely probably going to bring my wife on more as – I do want to interview more as a dietitian Mm -hmm. on the coaching side of things. I think you're coaching other dietitians currently. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different instead of coaching a client. I'd love to kind of break that soon in our next episode. But if you were to give like some type of – you've had amazing coaches before. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you had like one value or one attribute that made this coach amazing and it stood out, what would that attribute, what would that value be that made that coach effective? Well, you're one of my best coaches, I would say. And something that you can always do is be brutally honest. Okay. And I think you can't have a coach that's just a friend or like a buddy all the time. Just you're not going to see change. So the best coaches have an ability to be brutally honest with someone, show them and reveal something that they haven't seen within themselves. Because you can see, I can tell why you're doing it is because you can see the potential that I have. So you can't, I think there's a energy to it when you're trying to reveal a truth that I can't see. Mm -hmm. You're brutally honest in a way that's showing me that you know that I can do more and your confidence in me then makes me realize, oh gosh, maybe I can do this. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Some of my best coaches were the same. It almost feels like an attack. Mm -hmm. You're like, why is this? Why is I, I hired you as a coach. Why are you attacking me? Yeah. And then it, it, it then sits in. They don't have to attack you in that way, but they also have an essence and like elegance about it. Right. You know, it's not just like, hey, you suck at this. Well, and just like you were being triggered by some of the things that I was saying, mm-hmm. a coach will trigger in you a response. And usually that's when you, that's where the magic is at. They're going to trigger you to become a little bit angry because you can tell that it's a truth that you haven't been wanting to face. So if you're not getting that response, if you just feel like someone is like a, yeah. you know, a best friend to you and just telling you all of these nice things all the time, then yeah, you're not going to move as far as fast as if someone is just way more brutally honest and it's going to bring up a lot. But how are you going to grow if yeah that doesn't come up? Yeah. Well, growth, if you think about growth in general, it never feels amazing. No. Right? When you're growing a muscle, you're not like, yeah. 
Right. Right. But <laughs> unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger and he, he's like, it feels like I'm having an orgasm. And that's kind of like, th that's what his thing is. But most of the time, mm -hmm. growth is also like accustomed or right next to it is pain. Right. And being brutally honest has a consequence of pain. And I think that's just something we forget as as one, like as a student. Mm -hmm. We think the coach is just there to just like give us high fives and smiles. But a really effective coach sometimes will bring out the truth. Yeah. And that truth is painful. So I really love that. There was a scenario. I just want to share this last thing really quick. Mm -hmm. And you've seen me do this. I'll watch my coaches, coach other coaches, and I wait. And I'm, I'm like, I can't wait because I know right away they're about to cry. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, I think that's when they have the breakthroughs. So when a client and a client or a client and a coach has an interaction, they're just not working, they're not making progress, I bring them both in and I just wait. Yeah. And they both break down. Right? You just wait. You're like, hey, how, is, how do you feel about the outcome? And then the outcome is like, well, it's just not working. I spent, I invested all of this money, X, Y, and Z, and none of this stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, cool. How do you feel? And I asked that to a practitioner, and they're just like, I, f like, I feel like I'm failing you. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like, like I don't want to do that. And they go, on the, and they both cry. <laughs> they both cry. But then you need that element to, for them to break down, to have a breakthrough. And a good coach will, will bring out that honesty, will bring out all that emotion right up front, but then they'll take that emotion and then turn it into like a tree. Yeah. They'll turn it into beauty. And, 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 and that's just, I agree, the brutally honest. So if you're a coach listening to this and you're not being brutally honest, to your students in a kind way. There's a kind way to do it. There's a way to balance it out. You're missing a lot of their growth. Yes, they need friends, but they have plenty of friends. Mm -hmm. They don't have a coach. And a coach requires brutally honest, and that being brutally honest allows them to progress so much faster. Yeah. So, guys, that was the first episode. Hopefully you got to understand a little bit about me, a little bit about my wife, and... Um, I hope to see you guys in more of the episodes. And if you guys like this episode, make sure you guys share it, subscribe, punch the notification button. I'll see you guys later. Peace. Bye.